Thanks very much, Betty. And thanks to the Rogers Library for bringing me here. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we all know this is the anniversary of, of, of September 11th. And uh, one of the many lessons that I think we have learned from that, but one of the lessons is that it's important to know about other parts of the world. We're all connected in one way or another. And uh, that's, that's what I want to tell you about today, is about Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the title of the talk was Memoir of Zimbabwe, and that was a kind of vague title, and we left it that way on purpose because we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. Uh, and, and, you know, this was planned way back in April uh, that I would speak here. And a lot has indeed happened, and in fact, some important news has happened today. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is save that for the end and uh, start with, uh, with a kind of background uh, so that you'll understand what, what, uh, the importance of what has happened today better. Um, and so as, as Betty told you, um, I first came to Zimbabwe in 1980. Oh, for also, I'd like to paint a, just, I don't have a map here, but if, if you can follow, um, here is the map of Africa going down to the point. And that point down there at the bottom is South Africa. And Zimbabwe sits right on top of South Africa. It's in the middle with Mozambique on one side and Angola on the other. It's landlocked. Um, and it's a mile high. It's in the tropics, well within the, uh, the, the tropical zone. But because of uh, most of the country, three quarters of Zimbabwe, and it's about the size of France or the size of Montana. Um, and most of the country, three quarters of the country, is on a plateau that's a mile high. So that lifts the country out of the tropics into a subtropical zone. And because it's landlocked, it's, it's, it's got a, a very uh, dry uh, climate, the, there's very little humidity. So even when it gets very hot, like let's say 90 degrees, there's very little humidity. So that as soon as the sun goes down, it's a bit cool. Uh, almost like tonight, so that you almost always want to have an extra layer on. It's a lovely climate. Uh, it's never too hot and never quite too cold. It's great for agriculture. Um, and, so, uh, it, and so that's indeed how it was settled by the British um, uh, settlers. They went in the 1890s looking for gold, uh, and they never found a large uh, gold deposit, but they found that it was a nice place to live and they decided to stay, and they decided to start farming. Um, when I came in 1980, I was pursuing my life's goal, which was to become a foreign correspondent. And uh, I had been working as a journalist for seven years in the United States, um, and uh, I was looking for an opportunity. And when I saw Zimbabwe move from Rhodesia, from minority-ruled Rhodesia, to majority-ruled Zimbabwe, I thought, here's my chance. Um, and so I left my job in California, and I, I sold my car, and I bought a ticket over uh, to Zimbabwe, and uh, I pursued my goal uh, to become a foreign correspondent, and I was working as a freelance journalist. And in fact, uh, my timing was very good. All the war correspondents who'd been covering the Rhodesian War uh, with Ian Smith and, 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 and the kind of racial war that was going on there, and they'd been covering that for 10, 15 years, um, and they, all the war correspondents packed up and left when there was peace. And so when I arrived, it was peaceful, and there were uh, freelance opportunities uh, all over the place, and I was working within three days. Um, and that was great fortune for me. And uh, I found that I got to do one of the rare things uh, for a journalist. I got to write a positive stories. I was writing about how the country had moved from war to peace from a, a racial con a conflagration to racial reconciliation, uh, from, from, from poverty to in the improvement of the lives of the black majority. And I got to see how education improved, how health improved, um, how uh, maternal mort mortality rates uh, improved, how child mortality rates improved. And this was very exciting. I wrote about the first black Miss Zimbabwe, the first ma black mayor of Harare. Um, and these, uh, they may sound like trivial stories, but 
You know, usually a journalist is writing about death and disaster and, and mayhem, and this was a very exciting and optimistic time. And, and it's, it's hard to imagine now, but if we can think back to 1980, and look, I've just been lecturing at Harvard to 18-year-old students. When I tell them to think back to 1980, it's like they, they have no memory that far back. But I can look at this crowd, and you can remember 1980. Um, and so, you know, think back, because Zimbabwe at that time had moved, had been, you know, Rhodesia had been a trouble spot, an ongoing sore internationally, and then Zimbabwe appeared, and it seemed like it was, uh, you know, a very, you know, a, it was a very optimistic place. It seemed like, you know, things had worked out. And I was there at that time, and it was full, everybody was full of optimism uh, that things could work, and we all who were working there felt that uh, we... Uh, we're working to improve the lives of the majority of the country to build, uh, to build a country in Africa that was a success. And for many years, Zimbabwe did succeed. Um, and uh, it, for instance, uh, as I say, the health indicators got better, the education level got much better. Uh, the literacy rate in, in Zimbabwe reached a level of 90%, which is by far the highest in all of Africa. The economy was doing well. Uh, the, grow, uh, the, the, the GDP per capita moved right up to the top of, uh, of, of African countries, so it was in going to be in the middle income category, not the lower income category. But there were some problems. Robert Mugabe, who had uh, brought the country to independence, um, had, had appeared to be an international statesman, uh, a wise, magnanimous statesman, who instituted a policy of racial reconciliation. But as he was in power for more years, we began to see that he was really a very authoritative and intolerant uh, leader. Uh, and he, didn't, he wanted to tell everybody what to do. He didn't want suggestions from anybody else. Uh, I, in other words, he wasn't a very good democratic leader. Um, and he followed the Eastern European model. And uh, in 1983, he was trying to impose a one-party state on Zimbabwe. And uh, at that time, the opposition party in Zimbabwe opposed uh, the, uh, the, the creation of a one-party state, saying, no, we want a democracy with more than one party. And uh, to make a long story short, there was a, the opposition party had a, um, a, a small violent uh, protest uh, uh, in, in, in the southern part of the country, and Mugabe <coughs> sent the army in, uh, a special brigade of the army that had been trained by North Koreans, and uh, they went in, and over a period of two years, uh, they suppressed the, the uh, opposition, and, uh, an es and it was very violent, it was uh, bloody, and an estimated 10,000 people, maybe as many as 20,000 civilians, were, were killed at that time. Uh, and that was a challenge for me as a journalist. I had to take my optimistic blinkers off and start looking at things realistically, and that was uh, part of the time when I you know, grew up. Uh, and, and I couldn't just say it's good. I had to say no. This is wrong. Um, and and uh, uh, we like to think that the international coverage of these Matabele land massacres um, helped to curtail them. But in the end, uh, Robert Mugabe did uh, get. He didn't get a, a, an official one-party state, but he did merge with the opposition party and had a de facto, a, you know, a, a, a de facto one-party state. And as things went on, that was by the end of the 1980s. Throughout the 1990s, Mugabe became more and more authoritarian, and his party, ZANU-PF, uh, became more entrenched and got its, its hands on virtually every lever of power in the country, and every lever of the economy as well. And they were squeezing the mining area, the, the farming area, uh, the, the industrial part, uh, with corruption. And uh, people were getting fed up. Uh, and for a long time, uh, Mugabe had gone through a honeymoon period where many bl where black Zimbabweans in general would not criticize Mugabe. But after 10 years, after the Matabeleland massacres, as corruption grew, then the, the criticism and the questioning of Mugabe began as well. Um, until the year 2000. And by that time, an opposition party, a new opposition party, had uh, been uh, formed. The Movement for Democratic Change. 
and it did something special. It brought together um, Zimbabwe's whites and blacks. It brought together the Shona, which Robert Mugabe represented. They make up about 70% of the country, and the Ndebele. And they were the people who were killed in the Matabila and massacres. They make up about 20% of the country. So the movement for democratic change brought together the Shona and the Ndebele. They also brought together rural and urban Zimbabweans. Um, and uh, uh, trade unionists, church groups. It was a broad coalition, and it was all based on challenging Robert Mugabe. And they did it two ways. First, uh, politically, but also they realized there's something wrong uh, with the whole foundation of democracy in the country. It's the Constitution. And indeed, the Constitution had it was not created through a democratic process, uh, the Constitution in Zimbabwe was created in 1979 in London as a compromise deal between Ian Smith of Rhodesia and Robert Mugabe and some other, Joshua Nkomo and the British government, and they, they got locked into a smoke-filled room for a few weeks and they came up with a deal that, uh, that then brought Zimbabwe to majority rule elections. However, the Constitution itself was not something that people felt really attached to. Um, and it had a lot of uh, a very undemocratic aspects to it. Um, and so the, 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 in, by the year 2000, these flaws in the Constitution were, were very evident. For instance, there were no um, term limits for, the, for a president. And by that time, Mugabe had been president for 20 years. And so they were saying, we want a term limit for how long uh, any person can be president. We want a term limit for how long anybody can be in, in uh, the parliament. And um, Oh, unfortunately, what happened was Mugabe, who is a master politician, um, said, okay, he had the Constitutional Convention, but at the very end, he dropped in his own Constitution, which extended his time in power, extended the time his party could, uh, his members of his party could be in Parliament, and uh, he foisted it on them through a, a sleight of hand. Um, and uh, then that went to a national referendum. And it, it looked like Mugabe was going to trick everybody with that. But in fact, at the national referendum, the Zimbabwean voters showed that they weren't so dumb. Uh, they, they said they, they, and they showed that they were indeed literate. And they said, no, this is not the constitution we want. And they rejected it. And that was Mugabe's first uh, real uh, um, electoral defeat. And he was shocked by it. Um, and uh, he was really shocked and he was angry. Um, and uh, what happened after that, and that was in February of 2000, then after that, the um, land seizures began. Uh, the seizures of white-owned farms in Zimbabwe began. And at the same time that Mugabe was uh, seizing white-owned farms, which he said he was ridding the country of the last vestige of colonialism, okay, at the same time, he was also carrying out uh, a, a state violence against the black opposition, the movement for democratic change. And uh, more than 300 uh, a, a, um, opposition supporters were killed at that time. Um, so it was um, really a, a time of turmoil in Zimbabwe. Mugabe then became very, very violent, in fact. Um, and, and that's when we started to see state torture as well as killings. Um, and uh, Mugabe then, uh, after the, he lost the, Demo um, the referendum for the Constitution, there was a parliamentary election and everybody thought, well, okay, Mugabe is going to be going out. But he, he stirred up a lot of violent uh, uh, intimidation and he in uh, implemented a lot of vote rigging so that he won the parliamentary elections narrowly, but he still won. And it's, it's at that time that he focused on the press and the international press in, 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 uh, in particular. And he said that there was going to be a problem. Uh, you know, he said that it was the press that was creating the problem. It wasn't Mugabe, it was the press. And that's actually when I started to get into trouble. Um, uh, I was reporting on state torture. I was reporting on a, a violent intimidation. And, uh, and I was called a terrorist. Uh, a threat to national security, and uh, I was thrown in jail. Uh, I was put on trial for two months, but I, and I faced a jail term of two years, uh, but I was, uh, I was acquitted. Um, and then I carried out my work, but then I was uh, later abducted. And I have a little video uh, of this. It's seven minutes, uh, and it gives a, a potted history of Zimbabwe as well. 
So um, I hope you'll find it interesting. Once a symbol of African independence and promise, Zimbabwe has descended into a frightening and violent place. The brutality of its dictatorship is now occurring beyond the view of most of the world because foreign journalists have been expelled from the country. Last month, Andrew Meldrum, an American who writes for the British newspaper The Guardian, kept this video diary before he was forced to leave the country. Uh, I have declared a prohibited immigrant. I'm being deported now. I'm going directly to the airport. This is not the action of a government that is confident in its own legitimacy, and it is afraid of a free press, and it is afraid of a independent critical report. I was the last foreign journalist to be kicked out of the country by Mugabe's men. Public scenes like this highlight the regime's panic. I had been in Zimbabwe for 23 years, and for the first time, I believe his days are numbered. Until May 16, I was still working as a journalist in Zimbabwe. My work included writing about famine, torture, and chronicling the struggle for human rights and democracy. I came to Zimbabwe six months after Robert Mugabe first came to power. Then Mugabe was the face of the new Africa, proud, confident, assertive. He appeared a wise statesman calling for racial reconciliation. Twenty-three years later, the dream was dead. Mugabe's determination to hold on to power led him to smash the opposition, seize white-owned farms, and destroy the economy. On May 7th, I was forced to leave my home and began documenting my remaining time in Zimbabwe. Five men came to our gate. My wife went to the gate. One guy said he was from the immigration department. The others didn't identify themselves, and he, the, the man from him, said, who said he was from immigration refused to give identification papers. There were four vehicles there, one large van with blacked out windows. It was after dark. It was an intimidating situation. There have been three national strikes of two days, three days, and five days, which closed the country down completely. Both of them were specifically anti-government. Uh, it's clear the population is becoming more and more angry. They're suffering inflation of more than 228%, uh, which I can tell you I'm feeling it, so the average Zimbabwean is also really feeling it. There are food shortages, there's famine in the rural areas, uh, and this is happening in Zimbabwe where we have had a functioning democracy, where we have had an accountable government uh, within living memory within the past few years. Uh, and people don't like to see this erode before their eyes. The situation is very, very, very difficult. I would not think the thing is empty. The economy is out of control. The price of bread doubled the day I was removed from the country. A few bread rolls cost a day's wage, if you can get them. Hey, okay, Martha. Okay, you're going to bring it back to me. For a moment, I was able to return with my wife to see our home, our garden, and our dogs. <laughs> Come on. This was the place where I lived and worked. I became hopeful that I could stay. But that was not to be. Uh, we got a warning uh, to leave and not to go back to the place where we had been staying. So, so we left and we went into a hotel. Uh, the next day I went to my home again to prepare for a meeting with immigration. I asked him could he give me an assurance of my safety that they wouldn't try and nab me and deport me and turn me over to CIO or whatever and he refused to give any kind of assurance like that. Anticipating the worst, I tried to work out what of my life I could carry with me if I was deported. I went into this meeting with my lawyer full of apprehension about my future. If Yes. But what is it you know, you think you put that response? No, I'm, if you look on my reference permit, it says I am a journalist. But I am working as a journalist. My permit says journalist. Uh, so, I'm going to go over the 
I've taken my passport and my residency permit, and I will go back tomorrow uh, to carry on with this uh, inquiry. Uh, so that's, that's it. It is illegal. Uh, the government is just trying to muzzle me, to get rid of me, the last foreign, uh, the last foreign correspondent in Zimbabwe. And uh, I think they think by doing that, uh, that they are going to not only get rid of me, but they are going to frighten uh, the other journalists who work for the foreign media, they're all Zimbabwean citizens, and to frighten the, the, the very independent, uh, uh, privately owned press in Zimbabwe. They're going to frighten those journalists. But Zimbabwe's journalists continue to record what is happening, often at considerable personal risk. This government agent tries to seize a camera from the occupants of the car. Help! and douses it in gas. Is getting matches. Hurry up! They manage to escape. Other pictures, recently smuggled out, continue to depict the brutality that is meted out and show hospitals full of Mugabe's victims. This cameraman left in a hurry as Mugabe's men returned to beat patients in their hospital beds. Six days before I was forced to leave, it was Mother's Day in Zimbabwe. Even this innocuous holiday was turned into a pointed anti-government protest. A few days after the immigration official had confiscated my passport, I had to return to his office. It was at this meeting that they abducted me. This is not the action of a government that is confident in its own legitimacy and it is afraid of a free press. My lawyer had a court order to say that this was illegal, but immigration said that no court would stop them from kicking me out. They forced me on a plane, and I arrived in London early the next morning. Thanks, thanks. I want to continue to cover events in Zimbabwe. What has happened in the last few weeks has convinced me that by the end of this year, elections will be on their way. Africa has now turned on Mugabe. He will be forced to face his people, and with supervised elections, they will reject him. Why is the crisis in Africa so desperate? That conversation when we come back. Okay, now we come back here. Um, that happened five years ago. And since then, the situation in Zimbabwe across the board has only become worse. Uh, I was talking about inflation of 225%. The latest official rate of inflation in Zimbabwe is 11 million percent. And, and that means that if you're quoted a price, they start the clock and it goes for about 15 minutes and then the price goes up after that. And you know, it's not, you're not billed for it, you have to pay right away. The currency um, is uh, increasingly, it's used in bundles of bricks and now they're getting to be cement blocks. And uh, uh, as a friend of mine said, they take a wheelbarrow full of currency to the supermarket to go shopping and if a thief comes, they dump the currency out of the wheelbarrow and they take the wheelbarrow because that's more valuable than the money that it's in. Um, but uh, also what's happened is there have been another round of elections in this past year and uh, uh, the, the opposition again, the Movement for Democratic Change, uh, Morgan Changarai, the leader, they, they indeed, even despite violence and despite rigging, they won a majority in the parliament. Uh, they also, um, uh, the Morgan Changarai won more than uh, the most votes in the presidential race, but he didn't win according to the government's counting, which of course was, uh, you know, very flawed. But according to the government's counting, he did not win greater than 50% majority. And so that's what you need to become president, is more than 50% of the vote. Um, and so Mugabe then uh, uh, increased the violence and it went into a runoff election and eventually Morgan Changarai, the op opposition, pulled out um, because so many of his uh, supporters were being killed and he said, I can't ask them to support me uh, when, when people are being killed. And I mean, it was really a kind of gross violence. For instance, the new opposition mayor of Harare uh, went into hiding because he had heard that, uh, that they were coming and Mugabe's thugs were coming to kill him. Uh, he went into hiding. Uh, so the thugs went to his house and dragged away his wife and beat his wife to death. 
Um, you know, this was the wife of the new mayor of Harare. And two other uh, wives of opposition uh, officials were also killed. So it, it got to this point. So when Morgan Changarai said, no, I, I can't really in good conscience ask anybody to support me in these elections, I, 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 I could understand that. What's happened recently, in, in literally in the past two weeks, is there have been negotiations to try and reach some kind of mediated or negotiated solution uh, uh, for Zimbabwe. And, uh, in, 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 and what has happened is Mugabe has said, yes, I'll, I'll negotiate, and then he doesn't negotiate. And, uh, and then um, they, the, the president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, has come and tried to uh, uh, bring both sides together into a power-sharing agreement. But what Morgan Changarai, the opposition leader, has said is that um, he, his party has a majority in parliament. He won the most elections in the presidential race. And so therefore, he should be the one who has the most power in the country. But Mugabe says no, he should have power. Uh, so the talks have gone on and on and they have faltered. However, today, just in the past few hours, uh, it's been announced that an agreement has been reached. Uh, that there is going to be some kind of power-sharing agreement between the two. Um, and uh, what they say is Mugabe will be in charge of the cabinet, uh, but there will be a council of ministers, which Morgan Changarai, the um, opposition leader, will be in charge of, and that the, um, the, the, the parliament, which there is the, the opposition holds the majority in parliament, they will also be in charge of passing laws. So it looks on paper, although the details will, are, are only going to be announced on Monday, uh, today being Thursday. So it's only going to be fully announced on Monday. On paper it looks good, but frankly, I'll believe it when I see it. Mugabe is very clever, and I think he's got, uh, you know, he's figured some angle out on this. Because really what is needed is not just for Mugabe to get out of power, but what is needed is a full restoration of democracy. Um, what is needed are, are, are respect for the rule of law across the board, the dismantling of the uh, torture groups and, and, and the violent gangs that Mugabe has assembled. Uh, what is needed are rational economic policies that will get rid of inflation, that will stop printing money uh, that is, is, is worthless, and that will control government spending and stop pay paying government supporters with, uh, with bribes, because that's where all the money has been going. So, you know, these are the things that are needed, and, and, and I am not sure if Mugabe has any hand in the government that that will happen. So, um, I, this has been a brief uh, discussion of the situation, and what I would like now to do is open this up to questions, because then I can respond to what you're interested in. So, um, yes? How old is Mugabe? Mugabe is 84 years old. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's, he, he's... He's a, but he's a very, very spry and fit 84 years old. He doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he eats very carefully, he does yoga every day, and he likes what he's doing, and he has a wife who's more than 40 years younger than he is. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, uh, but to say he is, you know, he is a very fit 84. Uh, however, he does at times show signs of, of, of being tired and, and, and forgetfulness. Um, and, uh, you know, as we all know, um, there is a point uh, where something happens. Um, but so far he's shown no sign of that, and he really has shown that, and he's been, out, been able to outmaneuver not only Zimbabwean politicians, not only South African politicians, but also British, American, you know, he has really, he's a, he's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Yes? He's too clever to groom anybody. He doesn't want anybody waiting in the wings because he realizes they'll just knock him out. So he's, he's appointed within his own party. He has two or three different possible heir apparents, and he plays them off against each other so that they are vying between each other, not against him. Uh, and, and then, of course, he doesn't like the opposition at all. So um, that did, yeah, and so as a result, Zimbabwe has two vice presidents, not just one, but two vice presidents. Uh, and that way he keeps them, n neither vice president thinks that they can automatically assume power. Uh, he plays them off against each other and they're a little bit uh, un unbalanced. 
You had mentioned that you were the last journalist to leave. Were the others ousted like you were, or did they leave of their own volition? I was the last resident foreign correspondent. There are still some journalists in Zimbabwe, but they are Zimbabwean citizens. And I must say, I think they're doing a very good job, but they're under tremendous pressure, as, as I was. Um, yes, other journalists uh, went uh, more voluntarily than I had gone. Um, but, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and, and journalists still continue, so foreign journalists still try to get in. They sneak in as tourists to cover Zimbabwe, but a couple have been arrested. So most of the reporting that you see coming out of Zimbabwe is by uh, local journalists, Zimbabwean journalists. Um, oh gosh, we have so many questions. That's great. When you were forced to leave, did yes. they confiscate your home? No, they did not uh, confiscate our home. Although I did travel light, I traveled only with a, a, a little backpack, and that was it. And it was—I must say—that was the lightest traveling I've ever done. Um, but yes, our home is, is still in our. Uh, it, it, we still have the title to the home, um, and we've uh, managed to uh, rent it out. Uh, to a young French couple who teach at the French school. But throughout all of this, the French still keep their French school going. Um, and so we've been able to, uh, to keep the house uh, going, which is, which is just great. Um, uh, we're not getting anything from it, but we are able to, to keep, we don't have to put anything from here into it. Yeah. Any serious assassination attempts on them? No, there have not been. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, look, Mugabe, he, from the moment he came into power in 1980, he instituted very strong uh, security measures. And he travels in a convoy of, of more than 20 vehicles. Um, and, and at first we thought he was mad. Ian Smith used to drive around in his own personal car in, in, in the little city, um, and the little capital city. And so we thought Mugabe was just a bit crazy. But now we realize that he, you know, he, he, he really has... Uh, um, guarded himself very well against that. And may I say that, you know, it's more than just changing Mugabe. It's not assassination that will solve the problems. It is a restoration of democracy. That is what's needed. What is needed are free and fair elections, fully free and fair elections. I, I believe that those can happen and that, that Zimbabwe could quickly get back on a path uh, of prosperity and, 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 and of stability for its citizens. Um, but, but a lot of work has to be done to get to free and fair elections because the police have become completely uh, uh, politicized, the army as well. And then Mugabe has a couple, the youth brigade, the war veterans, um, and they are extra legal. Uh, that they, they, they don't have any authority under the law, but uh, they can go and uh, drag people away, beat them or whatever, and the police just fold their arms and say it's a political matter, there's nothing we can do about it. So, you know, what we need to see is, you know, to, to, to return the police and the army to uh, a, a professional status, not, a, you know, not a, a political status. Yes? I don't understand if the economy was going well. Yes. He had all the power he wanted. Uh, he wasn't being challenged at the time he changed. Why did he change? Well, he, he was challenged, and the economy was, it was, it was a centrally controlled economy. It had, was uh, uh, separate from, uh, he really didn't listen to market forces. For instance, for foreign exchange, it was, they would set how many U.S. dollars, uh, or how many Zimbabwe dollars would go for a U.S. dollar, and it was not a market force that would allow uh, that to work. And, and, and he would have set price controls for basic goods. Uh, so that often uh, food producers were producing things for less than uh, for more than what the official prices were. So the economy began to erode, and 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 and, and uh, it was getting worse. And then in uh, 2000, there was a challenge to him from the opposition party, and that's when he became more repressive and more repressive. Um, and so and and you know that that is what happened. Yeah. Well, was there ever a time when the international community, or the African Union, could have exerted any influence on him and failed to? Could they do so now? Yes. Try. Yes. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I do believe that the, the international community has an important role to play, but the African community has the most important role to play. And there, you know, when there were the 2000 elections and then the, uh, and the more, more recent elections this year in 2008, 
um, the African uh, Union and the Southern African Development Community should have very quickly said these elections were marred by violence and by rigging. However, uh, you know, this, uh, the opposition has won and this is what should be respected. Uh, and they should have said that very clearly. And in fact, uh, the former United Nations Secretary General, Kofi Annan, just said today uh, that African leaders made a mistake by not, in, uh, by not saying that Mugabe was not the legit. The, Kofi Annan said that the African leaders should have said Mugabe is no longer the legitimately elected leader of Zimbabwe. And they failed to do that. And I think that that has led us to this uh, un, you know, un uncertain point of, of negotiations that we've seen today. Um, yes. I'm from that end of the world, and I speak several tribal languages, so I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm sorry to say this, I'm not being racist, but you're never going to change that. Mugabe is going to stay there until as long as he wants. Nobody's going to get him out of that. As you said, he's a great manipulator, and he's going to manipulate himself in a position there. I cannot see anything. And I'm very worried that it'll come down to South Africa because we've got the Beke, as you just said. And he's a lame duck. And we've got Jacob Kuhn and Zuma that may be coming into his place. And we just worry that it could happen in South Africa, or was it happens in Zimbabwe. And South Africa is a vibrant country. And I'm just a little bit worried that it's happening in Zimbabwe at the moment. So I cannot see, knowing them, knowing their language, knowing their tribal laws, you're not going to get him out. I don't care what you say. <laughs> Do you feel the same way? Well, no. <laughs> uh, not quite. Not, not really. Uh, I, I believe that what, what, what many Zimbabweans are working for is a restoration of democracy. And for instance, in the video that um, you saw very briefly when I came out, I said, now what did they just tell me? And the, the small woman next to me was my lawyer, Beatrice and Tetwa. And, and she, uh, you know, they, they quickly separated us and then dragged me away. Beatrice and Tetwa, after representing me, uh, just to tell you a story, um, a little detour, but I think you'll find it interesting. A uh, few months before I was uh, abducted, <coughs> Um, I got a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. It was the BBC correspondent, and he said, they're trying to throw me out. They're trying to break down my door. They're going to kill me. Please come. And so I threw on my clothes, and I drove through the streets to his house, and sure enough, there were five guys with a tree trunk banging on his door, trying to bash it down. And I didn't know quite what to do. And then up drove a truck, and out stepped a woman who was considerably shorter than me, and that was Beatrice and Tetwa, his lawyer. And I thought, and then I thought, well, now what are the two of us going to do about this? And then the Reuters photographer came, and he started flashing his strobe onto the thugs with the battering ram. And they did what thugs do. They're afraid of light, and they ran away. Um, but, uh, and, and we got the BBC journalist to safety. Well, I looked at uh, Beatrice, and I thought, this is no ordinary lawyer. And I said, look, if I get into trouble, um, will you represent me? And she said, sure. And that was the best snap decision I ever made. Um, and when I was in jail, when I was in, you know, on trial, she ably represented me and got me acquitted, and she uh, stood up for me throughout. Shortly after I was thrown out, uh, Beatrice was um, uh, uh, taken in by police, and she was beaten by them badly. Um, and she recovered for two days, and then she went back to her office and she typed up uh, uh, assault charges and she went back to that same police station and filed assault charges on the officers who beat her. And she did it by herself. Um, and and well, the reason I'm telling you this is I'm trying to say that there are people in Zimbabwe, black Zimbabweans, who want to receive democracy restored and who are fighting for that. And they are putting their lives on the line. Um, I agree with you, and, and I believe in the end, history, uh, you know, time, over a period of time, I think that democracy will win. Win. Well, over time. I can't say tomorrow or this month or next month. Tomorrow. Well, I hope that you will. However, I do think that you are right in saying that there is, that South Africa faces an uncertain future. 
Um, and Zimbabwe is a, a precursor, or you know, it is a harbinger that does say, you know, democracy in South Africa, well, okay, Nelson Mandela is there, apartheid has ended, it's not all finished yet. Um, there is a lot of violence in South Africa. There is a disparity of wealth between the rich and the poor uh, that is greater now than it was under apartheid. Um, and that makes it a very unstable country. Um, and so, you know, I, I do feel that South Africa has an un the South Africa's democracy has an uncertain future. It does. It has a few things that uh, um, set it apart from Zimbabwe. It has a very strong constitution. It has a very strong um, civil society, uh, especially the trade unions. Um, and also um, um, church organizations, other civic organizations who are beginning to now challenge the ANC, um, so, uh, which is the ruling party. Um, so I am still hopeful that South Africa can avoid uh, the problems that Zimbabwe has gone through, but it's not by any means certain. I, 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 I was there a few months ago, and I'm worried so badly that South Africa is going to go this, the same way as Zimbabwe. I, I can't say that I don't, I, you know, it is a, a great worry. That's, that, that's all I can say, and we have to watch it very carefully. Hi, Andrew. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, basically, as I told you earlier, I was born in North Rhodesia, spent a couple of years in Zimbabwe at school, and my feeling is that the real problem in Zimbabwe, apart from Mugabe, is a Becky. A Becky has sees um, Mugabe as a, a, a fellow in arms, he's a freedom fighter with Mugabe, and he has been reluctant to exert any pressure. And at the meeting that you spoke of, it was Zambia, Botswana, and other countries who were vehemently opposed to Mugabe and said, you know, this man is illegitimate, government's illegitimate, and don't recognize him, but then Becky would not do so. So as far as I'm concerned, as soon as he leaves office, he has no respect in South Africa at all. The South Africans actually prefer Zuma. Zuma, with all these problems, no. has much more respect in South Africa. And Zuma will actually take a hard line with Mugabe and will probably have an effect. But my biggest concern about Zimbabwe is that the generals have all the power. And they certainly don't have to lose power, whether Mugabe's there or not. And, and in this uh, power sharing that you spoke about, who's controlling the army? I'm sure Mugabe controls it. Correct. Uh, Mugabe controls the army, and uh, as I've heard it, then uh, Changarai will control the police. I, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. I'm not sure, as I told you, I am not convinced that it's going to work, but uh, it is going to be interesting to watch. But they want amnesty. The generals want amnesty, and the police want amnesty. So that they cannot be prosecuted. Well, we don't know the details yet. So uh, uh, of, of this and how far the amnesty can go, and that's a big question about amnesty. Whether uh, people, in the interest of may having the country move forward, should those who have committed human rights abuses be uh, 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 left free of any charges? Uh, myself, I don't think so. However, I'm not living there now under 11 million percent inflation and with uh, you know people being dragged away uh, at night. And maybe maybe. Some people are saying it's better to you know to let sleeping you know to put that behind us and move forward, um, and and so it, it's a debate that's going on and we have to watch that to see. Yes. I don't expect an answer to my question. What do I want? It? It's rhetorical. Since the United States is so anxious to establish democracy throughout the world, why don't they go to Zimbabwe? <laughs> Well, you know, but it's a good question, and and my feeling is is that democracy cannot be established by force from outside. It, it, you know, what we can do is create situations where democracy grows up within a country, and it can be encouraged. But uh, it, you know, it, it, it's it's hard to see. You know, it, it's hard to solve the problems of every country in the, in the world. You understand. Yes, I do indeed. <laughs> I'm wondering uh, along this theme about democracy, uh, often we hear that has, you have to have institutions, that are, uh, the rule of law, for instance. It seems to be spoken of atrocities and, and, and famine that's occurring now, or very dire uh, 
about food shortages. And basically people, that, if they speak out, they are, are harmed. So how, how can you foresee democracy in that kind of environment? Well, the, the restoration of democracy. Um, and let me point out that uh, another thing that people in Zimbabwe are, are they, they want to see, a, a, you know, a respect for the rule of law. They want to see respect for human rights. Another thing that ordinary Zimbabweans want is freedom of the press. And it, it, I thought that it was something that people wouldn't pay any attention to, but they had a daily newspaper, an independent daily newspaper, the Daily News, that regularly reported on human rights abuses, on corruption, uh, on, on uh, the breakdown of the rule of law, and people avidly read that. And the government closed it down. And people point to that, and they said things got worse after the Daily News was shut down. And so they believe, you know, they also believe that freedom of the press is something important. And that also, my experience taught me something, which was that a role of a journalist is not to be a friend of a government. The role of a journalist is to hold the government accountable and to ask tough questions and often to have a government person wagging and saying, you know, that you have your own agenda or whatever. Uh, and, and you have to be unpopular. In other words, you're supposed to be a thorn in the side of a government. You're not supposed to be, uh, you know, making the life easy. It's, it's, it's a process, and I do believe that, 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 that Zimbabwe can get back on the track. I don't know when it's going to be. It's going to be a long time. Well, it may be a long time. It's already been a long time. But remember, over a period of history, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years is not that long. Um, and, and, that it, and, and we have to believe that, that, that I must believe that something, you know, that, that things are going to get better. And I see people like my lawyer. I see school teachers. I see, you know, uh, doctors uh, uh, treating torture victims in secret and putting their own lives on the line about that. I see people who are fighting for democracy, and, and I know that they will value that. And, and those are the people that I find heroes. Is there a business community uh, who owns the means of production? Is uh, the land collectivized? What, what's going on in the econ economic end? Economically, you know, you asked about three or four questions right there. Land now has been the the, the previously white owned farms, the privately owned farms, have been seized by the state, and they are controlled by the state, um, and they have put. Uh, that Mugabe has put his generals, his uh, lieutenants, his uh, Supreme Court justices, and other cronies uh, onto those farms. They have also moved some poor black people onto those farms as well, but none of them have title. Um, and so they are there at the government's behest, and the, gov the state owns uh, that land. So that is one of the reasons that the, the agriculture has plummeted. Uh, because if you can't get, you know, on big agriculture, you need a bank loan uh, to, to put in seed fertilizer for a year's crop. And you, banks won't give loans to, uh, to a, a, a land that you don't own title to. So there's a lot of, 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 of uh, reform that is needed uh, to improve the land situation. Then Zimbabwe also has a, a, a considerable industrial base. Um, and uh, right now, that is privately owned. But... The government sets uh, price controls on how much you can sell the goods are uh, for. So if you know, and, and, and if the price is less than what it costs to produce it, why then it becomes uneconomic. So right now, factories are operating at less than 20 percent of their capacity. Um, and then there's a third aspect of Zimbabwe's economy, which is mines. And Zimbabwe has uh, rich chrome deposits, gold. It has the world's second largest deposits of platinum, which has become an increasingly important and strategic mineral. Um, and the government is looking at that and saying, we want to take control of that. And they've already passed a law <laughs> saying that all mining firms, uh, all, all mining firms must cede 51% to black Zimbabweans, i.e. friends of Robert Mugabe's party. Um, so, uh, so they're going after the mining. Um, so this is, you know, as I say, you know, with the power sharing agreement, I don't, you know, I want to see if somebody is going to start managing Zimbabwe's economy rationally, uh, because that is what was is needed. Land reform, uh, you know, uh, market forces determining how the industry should operate, and then, uh, you know, proper uh, uh, regulation of mining, not politically motivated uh, and, and uh, corrupt uh, uh, regulation of mining. There were lots of questions. <laughs>
Has the violence against the opposition party ceased for now? For no, it has not ceased. What is it? It has, it has, it has uh, <coughs> gone down, but it has not ceased. I mean, I was reading, now it's one or two or three uh, uh, abductions and deaths, uh, you know, over a period of two weeks. Uh, whereas a, a, a couple months ago, it was in the, you know, 20, 30, 40 per week. Um, so it, it has gone down, but it has not stopped. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons that, uh, that Changurai is, is being forced to come to some uh, negotiated solution because he sees his, his supporters being picked off and victimized. Um, and, and he <coughs> hopes that if he controls the police, he can then uh, you know, use the police force to stop that. I'm, I'm still skeptical. <laughs> Um, they have so many other problems that uh, they haven't uh, decided to go for that, and also, um, as yet, they have not seized, uh, you know, any other uh, opposition uh, person's, um, uh, you know, um, private property. Um, if I had a farm, that would be something different. But this is a, you know, a small house. So, uh, um, but please don't give them any ideas. <laughs> Where do you go from here? Um, where do I go from here? That's a very good question. <laughs> I just had a fellowship at Harvard. Um, I finished that, and I taught at Harvard Summer School, uh, which I just finished. And I'm about to start working uh, 1st of October at a new uh, web-based international news agency called Global News. Um, and it's going to launch in January. And uh, it's based on the premise that people, that, there is, that the American public is not being well served uh, with international news in most newspapers. And uh, it, it, so it's going to put international news on the internet. On a, it's going to be a web-based service. Um, and uh, we're going to have 70 correspondents across the world. And, um, and I'm uh, going to be the senior editor for Africa. I'll be based in Boston, and I'll have seven correspondents reporting to me from Africa. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to providing good news uh, that way. Um, yes? Are there refugees from the country, in, in this country now, like Rwanda, we have many Rwandan refugees in, in the States, and I was wondering the situation in the country. Uh, that's an excellent question. In fact, uh, more than three million Zimbabweans have left the country. Three million out of a population of 13 million. So that's nearly 25%. And uh, most have gone to South Africa, uh, many have gone to uh, Great Britain, um, and there are, you know, there are thousands here in the United States. Uh, and generally, the, those who have gotten to Britain, the United States, and Australia are the best educated, uh, and and they often have uh, uh, um, nursing degrees, uh, therapist degrees, uh, doctors degrees, and so they are able to find work here in South Africa. Those are the, the, the lesser educated, and they are working or just trying to eke out a living as security guards. Uh, and everybody, that's one of the things that's keeping people alive in Zimbabwe is that virtually, with three million gone, virtually everybody has a family member who's living outside the country. And those, whatever they can earn, no matter how small, they are sending money back to their family members to try and help them buy food and <coughs> stay alive. Uh, yes? Uh, can I ask? Two things. One, would you introduce your wife? Oh. And two, then can we continue? Because you must be so thirsty. Okay, well, now I have some water here. We can um, well, okay, that's a great idea. First of all, I'd like my wife to stand. That's my wife, Dolores Cortez. And what I'd like to say about Dolores is she is an occupational therapist. Um, uh, she's been working with disabled children in Zimbabwe. She has a master's in public health, and for the past six years, she's been working uh, to provide medical care and counseling to victims of torture in Zimbabwe, and then when we were in South Africa, to Zimbabwean victims who had fled, South, fled, fled Zimbabwe for South Africa. And I am very, very proud of her work, um, and it has informed my work a great deal. Um, and I'll take two more questions and then we'll move back. Is that okay, Betty? Yes? Sure. What, uh, the farms were taken from yes. the people. Did they get anything for their property? No, no. Nothing. No, no. Not only did they not get anything, they lost a lot of their belongings. And in some cases, in, uh, it, was, it was very violent. There were 12 uh, white farmers who were killed. 
and more than 30 black farm workers who were killed in the same process. So, it, you know, it was, it was, yeah, yeah. And farm workers that became displaced. Sorry, sorry. And the farm workers that became displaced. Right, and um, aside from those farm workers who were killed, there were 300,000 farm workers who became displaced. And they were seen as, as kind of flunkies of the white farmers. And so they have become a kind of roaming homeless population in the country. So it, it's been become very difficult. I'm sorry, you had a question. Yes. Today. Yes. Well, it, you know, right now, the, 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 you know, the, the preliminary description of it looks like it's it even Stephen between the two. I don't, I'm skeptical. I, I, I really, I don't believe that Mugabe is going to give up the upper hand, not so easily. And I don't see how even 50-50 is going to work because they're so diametrically opposed. So as I told you, I mean, it's, it's, it's big news and it's, it's something, but I, the proof is in the pudding. I am not convinced that this is going to be the solution to Zimbabwe's problems. Do you remember Judas Nereru? Nereri, yeah. And he said to Robert Montgomery, Robert, you've got paradise. Don't mess it up. And he has messed it up. That was yes. No, no, he has. It's the Battle Ground of Rhodesia. That was a book that was written about Rhodesia. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.